Arthur Schopenhauer, Wikipedia article audio. Arthur Schopenhauer, 22 February 1788 September 21, 1860 was a German philosopher. He is best known for his 1818 work The World as Will and Representation, wherein he characterizes the phenomenal world as the product of a blind and insatiable metaphysical will. Proceeding from the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant, Schopenhauer developed an atheistic metaphysical and ethical system that has been described as an exemplary manifestation of philosophical pessimism, rejecting the contemporaneous post-Kantian philosophies of German idealism. Schopenhauer was among the first thinkers in Western philosophy to share and affirm significant tenets of Eastern philosophy having initially arrived at similar conclusions as the result of his own philosophical work. Though his work failed to garner substantial attention during his life, Schopenhauer has had a posthumous impact across various disciplines, including philosophy, literature, and science. His writing on aesthetics, morality, and psychology would exert important influence on thinkers and artists throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Those who have cited his influence include Friedrich Nietzsche, Richard Wagner, Leo Tolstoy, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Erwin Schrödinger, Otto Rank, Gustav Mahler, Joseph Campbell, Albert Einstein, Carl Jung. Thomas Mann, Emil Zola, George Bernard Shaw, Jorge Luis Borges and Samuel Beckett. Life Philosophy Schopenhauer was born on February 22, 1788, in the city of Danzig on Heiligigistgis, the son of Johannes Schopenhauer and Heinrich Floris Schopenhauer both descendants of wealthy German patrician families. When Danzig became part of Prussia in 1793, Heinrich moved to Hamburg, although his firm continued trading in Danzig. As early as 1799, Arthur started playing the flute, 30 in 1805, Schopenhauer's father died possibly by suicide. Arthur endured two long years of drudgery as a merchant in honor of his dead father, but his mother soon moved with his sister Adele to Weimar then the center of German literature to pursue her writing career. He dedicated himself wholly to studies at the Gotha Gymnasium in saxe gotha altenburg but left in disgust after seeing one of the masters lampooned. By that time, Johanna Schopenhauer had already opened her famous salon, and Arthur was not compatible with what he considered its vain and ceremonious ways. He was also disgusted by the ease with which his mother had forgotten his father's memory. He left to become a student at the University of Göttingen in 1809. There he studied metaphysics and psychology under Gottlob Ernst Schulz the author of Aenocytomus, who advised him to concentrate on Plato and Immanuel Kant. In Berlin, from 1811 to 1812, he had attended lectures by the prominent post-Kantian philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte and the theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher. Schopenhauer had a notably strained relationship with his mother. He wrote his first book, On the Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason, while at university. His mother informed him that the book was incomprehensible and it was unlikely that anyone would ever buy a copy. In a fit of temper Arthur Schopenhauer told her that his work would be read long after the rubbish she wrote would have been totally forgotten. In fact, although they considered her novels of dubious quality, the Brockhaus publishing firm held her in high esteem because they consistently sold well. Hans Brockhaus later recalled that, when she brought them some of her son's work, his predecessors saw nothing in this manuscript, 
but wanted to please one of our best-selling authors by publishing her son's work. We published more and more of her son Arthur's work and today nobody remembers Johanna, but her son's works are in steady demand and contribute to Brockhaus' reputation. He kept large portraits of the pair in his office in Leipzig for the edification of his new editors. In 1814, Schopenhauer began his seminal work The World as Will and Representation. He finished it in 1818 and Brockhaus published it that December. In Dresden in 1819, Schopenhauer fathered, with a servant, an illegitimate daughter who was born and died the same year. In 1820, Schopenhauer became a lecturer at the University of Berlin. He scheduled his lectures to coincide with those of the famous philosopher G. W. F. Hegel, whom Schopenhauer described as a clumsy charlatan. However, only five students turned up to Schopenhauer's lectures, and he dropped out of academia. A late essay, on university philosophy, expressed his resentment towards the work conducted in academies. In 1831, a cholera epidemic broke out in Berlin and Schopenhauer left the city. Schopenhauer settled permanently in Frankfurt in 1833, where he remained for the next 27 years, living alone except for a succession of pet poodles named Ottman and Butts. The numerous notes that he made during these years, amongst others on aging, were published posthumously under the title Senilia. Schopenhauer had a robust constitution, but in 1860 his health began to deteriorate. He died of pulmonary respiratory failure, on September 21, 1860 while sitting at home on his couch. He was 72. The World as Representation Schopenhauer saw his philosophy as a continuation of that of Kant, and used the results of his epistemological investigations, that is, transcendental idealism, as starting point for his own. My philosophy is founded on that of Kant, and therefore presupposes a thorough knowledge of it. Kant's teaching produces in the mind of everyone who has comprehended it a fundamental change which is so great that it may be regarded as an intellectual new birth. It alone is able really to remove the inborn realism which proceeds from the original character of the intellect, which neither Berkeley nor Malbranche succeed in doing, for they remain too much in the universal, while Kant goes into the particular and indeed in a way that is quite unexampled both before and after him, and which has quite a peculiar, and, we might say, immediate effect upon the mind in consequence of which it undergoes a complete undeception, and forthwith looks at all things. In another light. Only in this way can anyone become susceptible to the more positive expositions which I have to give. Theory of Perception Kant had argued the empirical world is merely a complex of appearances whose existence and connection occur only in our representations. Schopenhauer reiterates this in the first sentence of his main work, The World is My Representation. We do not draw empirical laws from nature, but prescribe them to it. Schopenhauer praises Kant for his distinction between appearance and the things in themselves that appear, whereas the general consensus in German idealism was that this was the weakest spot of Kant's theory, since according to Kant causality can find application on objects of experience only, and consequently, things in themselves cannot be the cause of appearances, as Kant argued. The inadmissibility of this reasoning was also acknowledged by Schopenhauer. He insisted that this distinction was a true conclusion, drawn from false premises. 
In November 1813 Goethe invited Schopenhauer for research on his theory of colors. Although Schopenhauer considered color theory to be a minor matter, he accepted the invitation out of admiration for Goethe. Nevertheless, these investigations led him to his most important discovery in epistemology, finding a demonstration for the a priori nature of causality. The world as will. Kant openly admitted that it was Hume's skeptical assault on causality that motivated the critical investigations of critique of pure reason. In it, he gives an elaborate proof to show that causality is given a priori. After G. Scholz had made it plausible that Kant had not disproven Hume's skepticism, it was up to those loyal to the project of Kant to prove this important matter. Art and Aesthetics The difference between the approach of Kant and Schopenhauer was this, Kant simply declared that the empirical content of perception is given to us from outside, an expression with which Schopenhauer often expressed his dissatisfaction. He, on the other hand, was occupied with, how do we get this empirical content of perception, how is it possible to comprehend subjective sensations limited to my skin as the objective perception of things that lie outside of me? Mathematics The sensations in the hand of a man born blind, on feeling an object of cubic shape, are quite uniform and the same on all sides and in every direction, the edges, it is true, press upon a smaller portion of his hand. Still nothing at all like a cube is contained in these sensations. His understanding, however, draws the immediate and intuitive conclusion from the resistance felt, that this resistance must have a cause, which then presents itself through that conclusion as a hard body, and through the movements of his arms in feeling the object, while the hand's sensation remains unaltered, he constructs the cubic shape in space. If the representation of a cause and of space, together with their laws, had not already existed within him, the image of a cube could never have proceeded from those successive sensations in his hand. Causality is therefore not an empirical concept drawn from objective perceptions, but objective perception presupposes knowledge of causality. Hereby Hume's skepticism is disproven. Ethics By this intellectual operation, comprehending every effect in our sensory organs as having an external cause, the external world arises. With vision, finding the cause is essentially simplified do light acting in straight lines. We are seldom conscious of the process, that interprets the double sensation in both eyes as coming from one object that turns the upside-down impression, and that adds depth to make from the planimetrical data stereometrical perception with distance between objects. Schopenhauer stresses the importance of the intellectual nature of perception, the senses furnish the raw material by which the intellect produces the world as representation. He set out his theory of perception for the first time in On Vision and Colors, and in the subsequent editions of Fourfold Root an extensive exposition is given in 21. Schopenhauer developed a system which is known as metaphysical voluntarism. The kernel and chief point of my doctrine, its metaphysic proper, is this, that what Kant opposed as thing in itself to mere appearance and what he held to be absolutely unknowable, that this thing in itself, I say, this substratum of all appearances, and therefore of the whole of nature, is nothing but what we know directly and intimately and find within ourselves as will, that accordingly, this will, far from being inseparable from, and even a mere result of, knowledge, differs radically and entirely from, and is quite independent of, knowledge, which is secondary and of later origin, 
and can consequently subsist and manifest itself without knowledge, that this will, being the one and only thing in itself, the sole truly real, primary, metaphysical thing in a world in which everything else is only appearance, i.e., mere representation, gives all things, whatever they may be, the power to exist and to act, is absolutely identical with the will we find within us and know as intimately. As we can know anything. That, on the other hand, knowledge with its substratum, the intellect, is a merely secondary phenomenon, differing completely from the will, only accompanying its higher degrees of objectification and not essential to it, that we are never able therefore to infer absence of will from absence of knowledge. For Schopenhauer, human desire was futile, illogical, directionless, and, by extension, so was all human action in the world. Einstein paraphrased his views as follows, Man can indeed do what he wants, but he cannot will what he wants. In this sense, he adhered to the Fichtean principle of idealism, the world is for a subject. This idealism so presented, immediately commits it to an ethical attitude, unlike the purely epistemological concerns of Descartes and Berkeley. To Schopenhauer, the will is a blind force that controls not only the actions of individual, intelligent agents, but ultimately all observable phenomena and evil to be terminated via mankind's duties, asceticism and chastity. He is credited with one of the most famous opening lines of philosophy, The world is my representation. Friedrich Nietzsche was greatly influenced by this idea of will, although he eventually rejected it. Eternal Justice For Schopenhauer, human desiring, willing, and craving cause suffering or pain. A temporary way to escape this pain is through aesthetic contemplation. Aesthetic contemplation allows one to escape this pain albeit temporarily because it stops one perceiving the world as mere presentation. Instead, one no longer perceives the world as an object of perception from which one is separated, rather one becomes one with that perception, one can thus no longer separate the perceiver from the perception. From this immersion with the world one no longer views oneself as an individual who suffers in the world due to one's individual will but, rather, becomes a subject of cognition to a perception that is pure, will-less, timeless where the essence, ideas, of the world are shown. Art is the practical consequence of this brief aesthetic contemplation as it attempts to depict one's immersion with the world thus tries to depict the essence-slash-pure ideas of the world. Music, for Schopenhauer, was the purest form of art because it was the one that depicted the will itself without it appearing as subject to the principle of sufficient grounds, therefore as an individual object. According to Daniel Albright, Schopenhauer thought that music was the only art that did not merely copy ideas, but actually embodied the will itself. Quietism He deemed music a timeless, universal language comprehended everywhere, that can imbue global enthusiasm, if in possession of a significant melody. Personal experience of an extremely great suffering that leads to loss of the will to live, or knowledge of the essential nature of life in the world through observation of the suffering of other people. Schopenhauer's realist views on mathematics are evident in his criticism of the contemporary attempts to prove the parallel postulate in Euclidean geometry. Writing shortly before the discovery of hyperbolic geometry demonstrated the logical independence of the axiom and long before the general theory of relativity revealed that it does not necessarily express a property of physical space Schopenhauer criticized mathematicians for trying to use indirect concepts to prove what he held to be directly evident from intuitive perception.
the Euclidean method of demonstration has brought forth from its own womb its most striking parody and caricature in the famous controversy over the theory of parallels, and in the attempts, repeated every year, to prove the eleventh axiom. The axiom asserts, and that indeed through the indirect criterion of a third intersecting line, that two lines inclined to each other, if produced far enough, must meet. Now this truth is supposed to be too complicated to pass as self-evident, and therefore needs a proof, but no such proof can be produced, just because there is nothing more immediate. Throughout his writings, Schopenhauer criticized the logical derivation of philosophies and mathematics from mere concepts, instead of from intuitive perceptions. Psychology Political and Social Thought Politics Punishment In fact, it seems to me that the logical method is in this way reduced to an absurdity. But it is precisely through the controversies over this, together with the futile attempts to demonstrate the directly certain as merely indirectly certain, that the independence and clearness of intuitive evidence appear in contrast with the uselessness and difficulty of logical proof, a contrast as instructive as it is amusing. The direct certainty will not be admitted here, just because it is no merely logical certainty following from the concept, and thus resting solely on the relation of predicate to subject, according to the principle of contradiction. But that eleventh axiom regarding parallel lines is a synthetic proposition a priori, and as such has the guarantee of pure, not empirical, perception, this perception is just as immediate and certain as is the principle of contradiction itself, from which all proofs originally derive their certainty. At bottom this holds good of every geometrical theorem. Although Schopenhauer could see no justification for trying to prove Euclid's parallel postulate, he did see a reason for examining another of Euclid's axioms. It surprises me that the eighth axiom, figures that coincide with one another are equal to one another, is not rather attacked. For coinciding with one another is either a mere tautology, or something quite empirical, belonging not to pure intuition or perception, but to external sensuous experience. Thus it presupposes mobility of the figures, but matter alone is movable in space. Consequently, this reference to coincidence with one another forsakes pure space, the sole element of geometry, in order to pass over to the material and empirical. This follows Kant's reasoning. The task of ethics is not to prescribe moral actions that ought to be done, but to investigate moral actions. Philosophy is always theoretical, its task to explain what is given. According to Kant's teaching of transcendental idealism, space and time are forms of our sensibility do which the phenomena appear in multiplicity. Reality in itself is free from all multiplicity not in the sense that an object is one, but that it is outside the possibility of multiplicity. From this follows that two individuals, though they appear as distinct, are in themselves not distinct. The appearances are entirely subordinated to the principle of sufficient reason. The egoistic individual who focuses his aims completely on his own interests has therefore to deal with empirical laws as good as he can. Views on Women What is relevant for ethics are individuals who can act against their own self-interest. If we take for example a man who suffers when he sees his fellow men living in poverty, and consequently uses a significant part of his income to support their needs instead his own pleasures, then the simplest way to describe this is that he makes less distinction between himself and others than is usually made. Regarding how the things appear to us, 
the egoist is right to assert the gap between two individuals, but the altruist experiences the sufferings of others as his own. In the same way a compassionate man cannot hurt animals, though they appear as distinct from himself. What motivates the altruist is compassion. The sufferings of others is for him not a cold matter to which he is indifferent, but he feels connected to all beings. Compassion is thus the basis of morality. Heredity and Eugenics Animal Welfare Views on Pederasty Schopenhauer calls the principle due which multiplicity appears the Principium Individuationis. When we behold nature we see that it is a cruel battle for existence, individual manifestations of the will can maintain themselves at expense of others only, the will, as only thing which exists, has no other option but devouring itself in order to experience pleasure. This is a fundamental characteristic of the will, which cannot be circumvented. Tormentor and tormented are one. Suffering is the moral retribution of our attachment to pleasure. Schopenhauer deemed that this truth was expressed by Christian dogma of original sin and in Eastern religions with the dogma of rebirth. He who sees through the Principium Individuationis and comprehends suffering in general as his own, will see suffering everywhere, and instead of using all his force to fight for the happiness of his individual manifestation, he will abhor life itself, of which he knows how inseparably it is connected with suffering. A happy individual life midst of a world of suffering is for him like beggar who dreams one night that he is a king. Those who have experienced this intuitive knowledge can no longer affirm life, but will exhibit asceticism and quietism, meaning that they are no longer sensitive to motives, are not concerned about their individual welfare, and accept the evil others inflect on them without resisting. They welcome poverty, do not seek nor flee death. Human life is a ceaseless struggle for satisfaction and instead of renewing this contract, the ascetic breaks it. It matters little whether these ascetics adhered the dogmata of Christianity or Dharmic religions, since their way of living is the result of intuitive knowledge. Intellectual Interests and Affinities The Christian mystic and the teacher of the Vedanta philosophy agree in this respect also, they both regard all outward works and religious exercises as superfluous for him who has attained to perfection. So much agreement in the case of such different ages and nations is a practical proof that what is expressed here is not, as optimistic dullness likes to assert, an eccentricity and perversity of the mind, but an essential side of human nature, which only appears so rarely because of its excellence. Schopenhauer referred to asceticism as the denial of the will to live. Philosophers have not traditionally been impressed by the tribulations of sex, but Schopenhauer addressed it and related concepts forthrightly. One ought rather to be surprised that a thing which plays throughout so important a part in human life has hitherto practically been disregarded by philosophers altogether and lies before us as raw and untreated material. He named a force within man that he felt took invariable precedence over reason, the will to live or will to life, defined as an inherent drive within human beings, and indeed all creatures, to stay alive, a force that inveigles us into reproducing. Schopenhauer refused to conceive of love as either trifling or accidental, but rather understood it as an immensely powerful force that lay unseen within man's psyche, guaranteeing the quality of the human race. The ultimate aim of all love affairs, is more important than all other aims in man's life, and therefore it is quite worthy of the profound seriousness with which everyone pursues it. What is decided by it is nothing less than the composition of the next generation. 
It has often been argued that Schopenhauer's thoughts on sexuality foreshadowed the theory of evolution, a claim which seems to have been met with satisfaction by Darwin as he included a quote of the German philosopher in his Descent of Man after having read such a claim. This has also been noted about Freud's concepts of the libido and the unconscious mind, and evolutionary psychology in general. Schopenhauer's politics were, for the most part, an echo of his system of ethics. Ethics also occupies about one quarter of his central work, the world as will and representation. In occasional political comments in his Perurga and Paralipomena and manuscript remains, Schopenhauer described himself as a proponent of limited government. What was essential, he thought, was that the state should leave each man free to work out his own salvation, and so long as government was thus limited, he would prefer to be ruled by a lion than one of fellow rats i.e., by a monarch, rather than a democrat. Schopenhauer shared the view of Thomas Hobbes on the necessity of the state, and of state action, to check the destructive tendencies innate to our species. He also defended the independence of the legislative, judicial, and executive branches of power, and a monarch as an impartial element able to practice justice. He declared monarchy as that which is natural to man for intelligence has always under a monarchical government a much better chance against its irreconcilable and ever-present foe, stupidity, and disparaged republicanism as unnatural as it is unfavorable to the higher intellectual life and the arts and sciences. Indology Buddhism Schopenhauer, by his own admission, did not give much thought to politics, and several times he writes proudly of how little attention he had paid to political affairs of day. In a life that spanned several revolutions in French and German government, and a few continent-shaking wars, he did indeed maintain his aloof position of minding not the times but the eternities. He wrote many disparaging remarks about Germany and the Germans. A typical example is, for a German it is even good to have somewhat lengthy words in his mouth, for he thinks slowly, and they give him time to reflect. Schopenhauer attributed civilizational primacy to the northern white races due to their sensitivity and creativity. Interests The highest civilization and culture, apart from the ancient Hindus and Egyptians, are found exclusively among the white races, and even with many dark peoples, the ruling caste or race is fairer in color than the rest and has, therefore, evidently immigrated, for example, the Brahmins, the Incas, and the rulers of the South Sea Islands. All this is due to the fact that necessity is the mother of invention because those tribes that emigrated early to the north, and there gradually became white, had to develop all their intellectual powers and invent and perfect all the arts in their struggle with need, want and misery, which in their many forms were brought about by the climate. This they had to do in order to make up for the parsimony of nature and out of it all came their high civilization. Thoughts on Other Philosophers Giordano Bruno and Spinoza Immanuel Kant Post-Kantian School Influence Selected Bibliography Online Citations Sources Biographies Other books Despite this, he was adamantly against differing treatment of races, was fervently anti-slavery, and supported the abolitionist movement in the United States. He describes the treatment of innocent black brothers whom force and injustice have delivered into devilish clutches as belonging to the blackest pages of mankind's criminal record.
Schopenhauer additionally maintained a marked metaphysical and political anti-Judaism. Schopenhauer argued that Christianity constituted a revolt against what he styled the materialistic basis of Judaism, exhibiting an Indian-influenced ethics reflecting the Aryan, Vedic theme of spiritual self-conquest. This he saw as opposed to what he held to be the ignorant drive toward earthly utopianism and superficiality of a worldly Jewish spirit. While all other religions endeavor to explain to the people by symbols the metaphysical significance of life, the religion of the Jews is entirely imminent and furnishes nothing but a mere war cry in the struggle with other nations. The state, Schopenhauer claimed, punishes criminals to prevent future crimes. It does so by placing beside every possible motive for committing a wrong a more powerful motive for leaving it undone, in the inescapable punishment. Accordingly, the criminal code is as complete a register as possible of counter-motives to all criminal actions that can possibly be imagined. He claimed this doctrine was not original to him. Previously, it appeared in the writings of Plato, Seneca, Hobbes, Pufendorf, and Anselm Feuerbach. In Schopenhauer's 1851 essay on women, he expressed his opposition to what he called Teutonico-Christian stupidity of reflexive unexamined reverence for the female. Schopenhauer wrote that women are directly fitted for acting as the nurses and teachers of our early childhood by the fact that they are themselves childish, frivolous, and short-sighted. He opined that women are deficient in artistic faculties and sense of justice, and expressed opposition to monogamy. Indeed, Rogers and Thompson in Philosophers Behaving Badly call Schopenhauer a misogynist without rival in Western philosophy. He claimed that woman is by nature meant to obey. The essay does give some compliments, however, that women are decidedly more sober in their judgment than are, and are more sympathetic to the suffering of others. Schopenhauer's controversial writings have influenced many, from Friedrich Nietzsche to 19th century feminists. Schopenhauer's biological analysis of the difference between the sexes, and their separate roles in the struggle for survival and reproduction, anticipates some of the claims that were later ventured by sociobiologists and evolutionary psychologists. When the elderly Schopenhauer sat for a sculpture portrait by the Prussian sculptor Elisabeth Ney in 1859, he was much impressed by the young woman's wit and independence, as well as by her skill as a visual artist. After his time with Nee, he told Richard Wagner's friend Malwitta von Maisenbug, I have not yet spoken my last word about women. I believe that if a woman succeeds in withdrawing from the mass, or rather raising herself above the mass, she grows ceaselessly and more than a man. Schopenhauer viewed personality and intellect as being inherited. He quotes Horace as saying, From the brave and good are the brave descended and Shakespeare's line from Cymbeline, Cowards father cowards, and base things sire base to reinforce his hereditarian argument. Mechanistically, Schopenhauer believed that a person inherits his level of intellect through his mother, and personal character through one's father. This belief in heritability of traits informed Schopenhauer's view of love placing it at the highest level of importance. For Schopenhauer the final aim of all love intrigues, be they comic or tragic, is really of more importance than all other ends in human life. What it all turns upon is nothing less than the composition of the next generation. It is not the will or woe of any one individual, but that of the human race to come, which is here at stake. This view of the importance for the species of whom we choose to love was reflected in his views on eugenics or good breeding. Here Schopenhauer wrote, 
with our knowledge of the complete unalterability both of character and of mental faculties, we are led to the view that a real and thorough improvement of the human race might be reached not so much from outside as from within, not so much by theory and instruction as rather by the path of generation. Plato had something of the kind in mind when, in the fifth book of his Republic, he explained his plan for increasing and improving his warrior caste. If we could castrate all scoundrels and stick all stupid geese in a convent, and give men of noble character a whole harem, and procure men, and indeed thorough men, for all girls of intellect and understanding, then a generation would soon arise which would produce a better age than that of Pericles. In another context, Schopenhauer reiterated his eugenic thesis, if you want utopian plans, I would say, the only solution to the problem is the despotism of the wise and noble members of a genuine aristocracy, a genuine nobility, achieved by mating the most magnanimous men with the cleverest and most gifted women. This proposal constitutes my utopia and my platonic republic. Analysts have suggested that Schopenhauer's anti-egalitarianist sentiment and his support for eugenics influenced the neo-aristocratic philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, who initially considered Schopenhauer his mentor. As a consequence of his monistic philosophy, Schopenhauer was very concerned about the welfare of animals. For him, all individual animals, including humans, are essentially the same, being phenomenal manifestations of the one underlying will. The word will designated, for him, force, power, impulse, energy, and desire, it is the closest word we have that can signify both the real essence of all external things and also our own direct, inner experience. Since every living thing possesses will, then humans and animals are fundamentally the same and can recognize themselves in each other. For this reason, he claimed that a good person would have sympathy for animals, who are our fellow sufferers. Compassion for animals is intimately associated with goodness of character, and it may be confidently asserted that he who is cruel to living creatures cannot be a good man. Nothing leads more definitely to a recognition of the identity of the essential nature in animal and human phenomena than a study of zoology and anatomy. The assumption that animals are without rights and the illusion that our treatment of them has no moral significance is a positively outrageous example of Western crudity and barbarity. Universal compassion is the only guarantee of morality. In 1841, he praised the establishment, in London, of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and also the Animals Friends Society in Philadelphia. Schopenhauer even went so far as to protest against the use of the pronoun it in reference to animals because it led to the treatment of them as though they were inanimate things. To reinforce his points, Schopenhauer referred to anecdotal reports of the look in the eyes of a monkey who had been shot and also the grief of a baby elephant whose mother had been killed by a hunter. He was very attached to his succession of pet poodles. Schopenhauer criticized Spinoza's belief that animals are to be used as a mere means for the satisfaction of humans. In the third, expanded edition of the world as will and representation, Schopenhauer added an appendix to his chapter on the metaphysics of sexual love. He wrote that pederasty did have the benefit of preventing ill-begotten children. Concerning this, he stated that the vice we are considering appears to work directly against the aims and ends of nature and that in a matter that is all-important and of the greatest concern to her it must in fact serve these very aims, although only indirectly, as a means for preventing greater evils. Schopenhauer ends the appendix with the statement that by expounding these paradoxical ideas, 
I wanted to grant to the professors of philosophy a small favor. I have done so by giving them the opportunity of slandering me by saying that I defend and commend pederasty. Schopenhauer read the Latin translation of the ancient Hindu texts, the Upanishads, which French writer Inquitil du Perron had translated from the Persian translation of Prince Dara Shako entitled Sir Akbar. He was so impressed by their philosophy that he called them the production of the highest human wisdom, and believed they contained superhuman concepts. The Upanishads was a great source of inspiration to Schopenhauer. Writing about them, he said, It is the most satisfying and elevating reading which is possible in the world, it has been the solace of my life and will be the solace of my death. It is well known that the book Unekat always lay open on his table, and he invariably studied it before sleeping at night. He called the opening up of Sanskrit literature the greatest gift of our century and predicted that the philosophy and knowledge of the Upanishads would become the cherished faith of the West. Schopenhauer was first introduced to the 1802 Latin Upanishad translation through Friedrich Major. They met during the winter of 1813-1814 in Weimar at the home of Schopenhauer's mother according to the biographer Safransky. Major was a follower of Herder, and an early Indologist. Schopenhauer did not begin a serious study of the Indic texts, however, until the summer of 1814. Sanchfrinsky maintains that between 1815 and 1817, Schopenhauer had another important cross-pollination with Indian thought in Dresden. This was through his neighbor of two years, Karl Christian Friedrich Krauss. Krauss was then a minor and rather unorthodox philosopher who attempted to mix his own ideas with that of ancient Indian wisdom. Krauss had also mastered Sanskrit, unlike Schopenhauer, and the two developed a professional relationship. It was from Krauss that Schopenhauer learned meditation and received the closest thing to expert advice concerning Indian thought. Most noticeable, in the case of Schopenhauer's work, was the significance of the Shandochya Upanishad, whose Mahavakya, Tativam Aci, is mentioned throughout the world as will and representation. Schopenhauer noted a correspondence between his doctrines and the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. Similarities centered on the principles that life involves suffering, that suffering is caused by desire, and that the extinction of desire leads to liberation. Thus three of the Four Truths of the Buddha correspond to Schopenhauer's doctrine of the will. In Buddhism, however, while greed and lust are always unskillful, desire is ethically variable it can be skillful, unskillful, or neutral. For Schopenhauer, will had ontological primacy over the intellect, in other words, desire is understood to be prior to thought. Schopenhauer felt this was similar to notions of Puru, Artha or goals of life in Vedanta Hinduism. In Schopenhauer's philosophy, denial of the will is attained by either. However, Buddhist nirva, a is not equivalent to the condition that Schopenhauer described as denial of the will. Nirva, a is not the extinguishing of the person as some Western scholars have thought but only the extinguishing of the flames of greed, hatred, and delusion that assail a person's character. A cult historian Jocelyn Godwin stated, it was Buddhism that inspired the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer, and, through him, attracted Richard Wagner. This Orientalism reflected the struggle of the German Romantics, in the words of Leon Poliakoff to free themselves from Judeo-Christian fetters. In contradistinction to Godwin's claim that Buddhism inspired Schopenhauer, 
the philosopher himself made the following statement in his discussion of religions. If I wished to take the results of my philosophy as the standard of truth, I should have to concede to Buddhism preeminence over the others. In any case, it must be a pleasure to me to see my doctrine in such close agreement with a religion that the majority of men on earth hold as their own, for this numbers far more followers than any other. And this agreement must be yet the more pleasing to me, inasmuch as in my philosophizing I have certainly not been under its influence. For up till 1818, when my work appeared, there was to be found in Europe only a very few accounts of Buddhism. Buddhist philosopher Nishitani Kiji, however, sought to distance Buddhism from Schopenhauer. While Schopenhauer's philosophy may sound rather mystical in such a summary, his methodology was resolutely empirical, rather than speculative or transcendental. Philosophy, is a science and as such has no articles of faith, accordingly, in it nothing can be assumed as existing except what is either positively given empirically, or demonstrated through indubitable conclusions. Also note. This actual world of what is knowable, in which we are and which is in us, remains both the material and the limit of our consideration. The argument that Buddhism affected Schopenhauer's philosophy more than any other Dharmic faith loses more credence when viewed in light of the fact that Schopenhauer did not begin a serious study of Buddhism until after the publication of The World as Will and Representation in 1818. Scholars have started to revise earlier views about Schopenhauer's discovery of Buddhism. Proof of Early Interest and Influence however, appears in Schopenhauer's 1815-16 notes about Buddhism. They are included in a recent case study that traces Schopenhauer's interest in Buddhism and documents its influence. Other scholarly work questions how similar Schopenhauer's philosophy actually is to Buddhism. Schopenhauer had a wide range of interests, from science and opera to occultism and literature. In his student years Schopenhauer went more often to lectures in the sciences than philosophy. He kept a strong interest as his personal library contained near to 200 books of scientific literature at his death, and his works refer to scientific titles not found in the library, 170. Many evenings were spent in the theatre, opera, and ballet. The operas of Mozart, Rossini, and Bellini were especially esteemed. Schopenhauer considered music to be the highest art and played the flute during his whole life. 30. As a polyglot, the philosopher knew German, Italian, Spanish, French, English, Latin, and ancient Greek, and he was an avid reader of poetry and literature. He particularly revered Goethe, Petrarch, Calderon, and Shakespeare. If Goethe had not been sent into the world simultaneously with Kant in order to counterbalance him, so to speak, in the spirit of the age, the latter would have been haunted like a nightmare many an aspiring mind and would have oppressed it with great affliction. But now the two have an infinitely wholesome effect from opposite directions and will probably raise the German spirit to a height surpassing even that of antiquity, 240. In philosophy, his most important influences were, according to himself, Kant, Plato and the Upanishads. Concerning the Upanishads and Vedas, he writes in the world as will and representation. If the reader has also received the benefit of the Vedas, the access to which by means of the Upanishads is in my eyes the greatest privilege which this still young century may claim before all previous centuries, if then the reader, I say, has received his initiation in primeval Indian wisdom, and received it with an open heart, he will be prepared in the very best way for hearing what I have to tell him.
it will not sound to him strange, as to many others, much less disagreeable, for I might, if it did not sound conceited, contend that every one of the detached statements which constitute the Upanishads, may be deduced as a necessary result from the fundamental thoughts which I have to enunciate, though those deductions themselves are by no means to be found there. Schopenhauer saw Bruno and Spinoza as unique philosophers who were not bound to their age or nation. Both were fulfilled by the thought, that as manifold the appearances of the world may be, it is still one being, that appears in all of them. Consequently, there is no place for God as creator of the world in their philosophy, but God is the world itself. Schopenhauer expressed his regret that Spinoza stuck for the presentation of his philosophy with the concepts of scholasticism and Cartesian philosophy, and tried to use geometrical proofs that do not hold because of the vagueness and wideness of the definitions. It is the common preference of philosophers of abstraction over perception. Bruno on the other hand, who knew much about nature and ancient literature, presents his ideas with Italian vividness, and is amongst philosophers the only one who comes near Plato's poetic and dramatic power of exposition. Schopenhauer noted that their philosophies do not provide any ethics, and it is therefore very remarkable that Spinoza called his main work ethics. In fact, it could be considered to be complete from the standpoint of life affirmation, if one completely ignores morality and self-denial. It is yet even more remarkable that Schopenhauer mentions Spinoza as an example of the denial of the will, if one uses the French biography by Jean-Maximilien Lucas as the key to De Intellectus e Mendationi. The importance of Kant for Schopenhauer, in philosophy as well as on a personal level, can hardly be overstated. The philosophy of Kant was the foundation of his own. Schopenhauer maintained that Kant stands in the same relation to philosophers such as Berkeley and Plato, as Copernicus to Heistus, Philo Laus, and Aristarchus, Kant succeeded in demonstrating what previous philosophers merely asserted. In his study room one bust was of Buddha, the other was of Kant. The bond which Schopenhauer felt with the philosopher of Königsberg may be esteemed in a poem he dedicated to Kant. With my eyes I followed thee into the blue sky, and there thy flight dissolved from view. Alone I stayed in the crowd below. Thy word and thy book my only solace. Schopenhauer dedicated one-fifth of his main work, The World as Will and Representation, to a criticism of the Kantian philosophy. The leading figures of post-Kantian philosophy, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, were not respected by Schopenhauer. He argued that they were no philosophers at all, who merely sought to impress the public. All this explains the painful impression with which we are seized when, after studying genuine thinkers, we come to the writings of Fichte and Schelling, or even to the presumptuously scribbled nonsense of Hegel, produced as it was with a boundless, though justified, confidence in German stupidity. With those genuine thinkers one always found an honest investigation of truth and just as honest an attempt to communicate their ideas to others. Therefore whoever reads Kant, Locke, Hume, Malbranche, Spinoza, and Descartes feels elevated and agreeably impressed. This is produced through communion with a noble mind which has and awakens ideas and which thinks and sets one thinking. The reverse of all this takes place when we read the above-mentioned three German sophists. An unbiased reader opening one of their books and then asking himself whether this is the tone of a thinker wanting to instruct or that of a charlatan wanting to impress, cannot be five minutes in any doubt, here everything breathes so much of dishonesty. Schelling was deemed to be the most talented of the three, 
and Schopenhauer wrote that he would recommend his elucidatory paraphrase of the highly important doctrine of Kant concerning the intelligible character, if he had been honest enough to admit he was showing off with the thoughts of Kant, instead of hiding this relation in a cunning manner. Schopenhauer's favorite subject of attacks was Hegel, whom he considered to be unworthy even of Fichte and Schelling. Whereas Fichte was merely a windbag, Hegel was a stupid and clumsy charlatan. Karl Popper agreed with this distinction. Schopenhauer had a large posthumous impact and remained the most influential German philosopher until the First World War. His philosophy was a starting point for a new generation of philosophers, which consisted of Julius Bonson, Paul Dusen, Lazar Hellenbach, von Hartmann, Ernst Lindner, Mainlander, Nietzsche, Olga Plumacher, and Agnes Talbert. His legacy shaped the intellectual debate, and forced movements that were utterly opposed to him, Neo-Kantianism and Positivism, to address issues they would otherwise have completely ignored, and in doing so he changed them markedly. The French writer Maupassant commented that today even those who execrate him seem to carry in their own souls particles of his thought. Other philosophers of the 19th century who cited his influence include Hans Weinger, Folkelt, Solovyov, and Weininger. Schopenhauer was well read amongst physicists, most notably Einstein, Schrödinger, Wolfgang Pauli, and Majorana. Einstein described Schopenhauer's thoughts to be a continual consolation and called him a genius. In his Berlin study three figures hung on the wall, Faraday, Maxwell, Schopenhauer, 87 Conrad Waxman recalled, he often sat with one of the well-worn Schopenhauer volumes, and as he sat there, he seemed so pleased, as if he were engaged with a serene and cheerful work. 92. When Erwin Schrödinger discovered Schopenhauer he considered switching his study of physics to philosophy. He maintained the idealistic and monistic worldview during the rest of his life, 132. But most of all Schopenhauer is famous for his influence on artists. Richard Wagner, writing in his autobiography, remembered his first impression that Schopenhauer left on him. Articles Schopenhauer's book was never completely out of my mind, and by the following summer I had studied it from cover to cover four times. It had a radical influence on my whole life. Wagner also commented on that serious mood, which was trying to find ecstatic expression created by Schopenhauer inspired the conception of Tristan Uendi Isolde. The admiration was not mutual, and Schopenhauer proclaimed, I remain faithful to Rossini and Mozart. Nevertheless, Wagner remained an adherent of Schopenhauer for the rest of his life. See also influence of Schopenhauer on Tristan Uendi Isolde. Under the influence of Schopenhauer Leo Tolstoy became convinced that the truth of all religions lies in self-renunciation. When he read his philosophy he exclaimed at present I am convinced that Schopenhauer is the greatest genius among men. It is the whole world in an incomparably beautiful and clear reflection. He said that what he has written in War and Peace is also said by Schopenhauer in the world as will and representation. Jorge Luis Borges remarked that the reason he had never attempted to write a systematic account of his world view, despite his penchant for philosophy and metaphysics in particular, was because Schopenhauer had already written it for him. Other figures in literature who were strongly influenced by Schopenhauer were Thomas Mann, Afanasiy Fet, J.K. Hoismans and George Santayana. Friedrich Nietzsche owed the awakening of his philosophical interest to reading the world as will and representation and admitted that he was one of the few philosophers that he respected, 
dedicating to him his essay Schopenhauer als Erzi her one of his untimely meditations. As a teenager, Ludwig Wittgenstein adopted Schopenhauer's epistemological idealism. However, after his study of the philosophy of mathematics, he rejected epistemological idealism for Gottlob Frege's conceptual realism. In later years, Wittgenstein was highly dismissive of Schopenhauer, describing him as an ultimately shallow thinker. Schopenhauer has quite a crude mind, where real depth starts, his comes to an end. His friend Bertrand Russell had a low opinion on the philosopher, and attacked him in his famous history of Western philosophy for hypocritically praising asceticism yet not acting upon it. On the opposite Isle of Russell on the foundations of mathematics, the Dutch mathematician L. E. J. Brouwer incorporated the ideas of Kant and Schopenhauer in intuitionism, where mathematics is considered to be a purely mental activity instead of an analytic activity wherein objective properties of reality are revealed. Brouwer was also influenced by Schopenhauer's metaphysics, and wrote an essay on mysticism. <laughs>